Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, our Future Climate for Africa webinar today uh, on the topic of communicating climate information and uncertainty better, cognitive psychology insights and practical experiences. Um, I'd like to welcome all our attendees to uh, this webinar. My name is Jean Peru. I'm a program manager for the Future Climate for Africa program based at South South North in Cape Town. And it's my pleasure to be the facilitator uh, for today's webinar. Um, today is going to be our 12th webinar for this calendar year uh, and the, the final one for the calendar year and we've really enjoyed using this as a platform to exchange ideas uh, between researchers and, and other wider communities who have an interest in the future climate for Africa topics. Um, for those who are new and who are joining us for the first time, um, Future Climate for Africa is a five-year research program um, aimed at significantly improving our scientific understanding of climate variability and climate change uh, over the African continent, as well as the impacts of climate change on specific development decisions. And alongside that, um, the program is also aimed at demonstrating flexible methods uh, for integrating improved climate information uh, and tools in specific decision-making uh, contexts. And it's particularly with regards to the latter uh, that um, today's topic is quite pertinent. Um, many of the FCFA research partners have had to, to deal with uh, the challenges and opportunities of improving approaches to communicating climate information and uncertainty better. Um, this is partially and sometimes narrowly a matter of presentation skills and judgments around visualizing data and visualizing uncertainty for a particular audience. Uh, but more broadly and importantly, uh, it's also about designing processes of engagement between researchers and decision makers that, that serve to build trust and mutual understanding about what information ought to be brought to bear on a particular joint intervention or what might count as salient, credible, and uh, legitimate knowledge. So today's webinar is going to draw on the learning from two of FCFA's research consortia. Uh, the first is AMA 2050 team working in West Africa, and the second team is the Fractal team working in Southern Africa. If you'd like to learn more about their work, uh, all of the research outputs and other resources can be accessed on the websites noted on your screen. And if you want to stay abreast of, of the work, uh, please sign up to the FCFA newsletter uh, and follow the various partners uh, on Twitter. I'm going to keep the introduction very brief because we have quite a busy agenda. So um, our agenda for today, firstly, uh, is going to run as follows. Um, after I've done the, the, the virtual housekeeping, um, Emma Visman and Tanya Varnas is going to be sharing some of the experiences from the AMA 2050 research project uh, and how they've uh, gone about communicating changes in the West African monsoon. After that, uh, they'll be followed by Dr. Chris Jack, who will be presenting on some of Fractal's work in using climate risk narratives for city region scale decision making. Uh, and then following on that, uh, we'll have uh, Dr. Jordan Harold and Dr. Irene Lorenzoni from UEA sharing some uh, challenges and insights from the psychology, discipline of uh, psychology. Now in FCFA, uh, we've put quite a, a high emphasis on trying to learn a lot about uh, the process of communicating climate information and co-producing that with a varied number of users. And we've asked uh, Jordan and Irene from UEA to also help us with the study um, to gain some more intelligence from FCFA researchers and the stakeholders involved uh, in our pilot studies. So they'll be sharing some of the findings there. We'll close things off with a Q&A uh, with the attendees uh, and a poll at the end. Uh, before I hand over to the, the speakers, um, just a brief note on, on who they are. Um, and uh, firstly, we will have Emma Visman and Tanya. So Emma has been working on humanitarian projects and, and conflict prevention since the early 1990s. Uh, in the past decade, she's been focused on strengthening climate resilience across East and West Africa, uh, particularly on developing approaches to support um, dialogue between the providers and the users of climate information. Uh, Tanya yeah, is uh, currently managing a, several multidisciplinary research projects at the Center for Ecology and Hydrology in Wallingford. Uh, 
and she's been working to promote the use of, of scientific evidence and decision making uh, on the topics of water and climate change. And she's also trained as an eco hydrologist. Uh, Chris from UCT, uh, he's a senior researcher at the Climate Systems Analysis Group, and he has a wide range of interests, um, ranging from high performance computing and big data methods through to societal engagements um, and decision making theory. Uh, we'll cap that off with, with Jordan and Irene, who are both based at the, the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change at the University of East Anglia in the UK. Uh, Jordan's applied an applied cognitive psychologist, and he's been supporting the communication of, of scientific, um, uh, scientific information about climate change with, with uh, society, uh, including some work with the IPCC. And Irene is um, an environmental and social science scientist and senior lecturer. Um, at also at the Tyndall Centre. Uh, with that, um, a quick note on how we'll be, how I'll be moderating the discussion um, in Zoom and how you can pose questions uh, to the panelists. So on your screen now, you'll see the basic uh, interface uh, that you have. Uh, there's a chat screen on your right that you should be able to access. Uh, we're using that chat interface generally to pose questions if you've got technical difficulties around sound or video uh, or would like to introduce yourself. Uh, so that feed is running and, and is live. Uh, if you, however, have questions about content and questions that you would like to direct to our panelists during the Q&A, uh, then you'll see there's a Q&A button at the bottom middle of the screen. And if you click on that, there'll be a Q&A box that pops up and you'll be able to submit uh, written uh, questions to particular panelists, which we'll then answer during the Q&A. Uh, we'll be taking all of our questions in written form just because uh, with a webinar of, of this size, uh, it's, it's not always possible to, to take uh, and moderate verbal questions. I see at the moment we are now just short of 100 uh, participants, um, so, so things are looking good. And uh, with that, I am going to hand over to um, Emma and Tanya um, to share more on Emma 2050's work. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, JP, for the introduction. Um, and while the slides are just being put up about um, AMA 2050, a brief introduction to the project. Um, AMA 2050, or the African Monsoon Multidisciplinary Analysis Project, brings together a wide range of partners from across West Africa, uh, research institutions and bodies, uh, government and different bodies, uh, from across West Africa and also from France and the UK. Uh, next slide, please. So the aims of the AMA 2050 project are to look at how the West African monsoon will change in future decades and how this information can support development decision making within the region. So we're really looking at the drivers of high impact weather and assessing the trustworthiness of high impact weather projections and thinking about how this can inform uh, decision making. Next slide, please. So the project has two pilot studies and for this project, this uh, Communicating Climatic Uncertainties project, we've really been focused on the one in Senegal. And this is looking at uh, developing climate resilient agricultural practices. Uh, next slide, please. So in AMA 2050, <clears throat> we've um, been employing a wide range of approaches for communicating climatic uncertainties. Um, we're talking today and for this project, really focusing on the stakeholder slides but we have also been employing a number of different other approaches, including the plateau game, participatory modeling, theatre forum and Café Scientifique. And we'd be happy to provide further information on those. But in terms of the stakeholder slides, which have really been the focus for this project on communicating climatic uncertainties, I'll now hand over to my colleague Tanya Vanas at the Centre of Ecology and Hydrology. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Emma. So just to um, 
also go in a bit more detail in early on in the project of AMA 2050 in 2016 we uh, prepared a number of slides which aimed to uh, describe our current knowledge um, of projected changes across the Sahel. These slides act as a, as a baseline of our current scientific understanding at the time to clarify what um, informations we were certain about but also to include um, the uncertainty into this. So we were building a consensus based on the, the knowledge and experiences of the scientists and researchers working on the project so that we could share a common message of our understanding with stakeholders and decision makers across the region. So for example, looking at um, communications with forums at the national and lo local government decision makers, their technical advisors, in order to inform national adaptation plans. Um, and in, in particular for this uh, seminar today, we are focusing on the work done in Senegal. Um, and th these slides provide an information about our understanding, but also were a tool through which the stakeholders could feedback and interact with us on the information we were presenting and describing. And they were not meant to be a, a one-off product. They have been revised in order to incorporate emerging scientific understanding. Next slide. So to give an idea of the types of information that went into these slides, we had a stand a, a high line question, will the wet season get longer by 2050 in the Sahel? So we were looking at uh, Senegal and Burkina Faso, which are the two countries we're focusing on. And in this case, um, we have represented in these graphs three different scenarios with results from 29 models, looking at the change in the start of the growing season. So comparing present conditions with uh, future projections. So in the case of Senegal, um, the message that we could draw from this were, yes, we could expect delays for the growing season. However, in the case of Burkina Faso, the, the spread of information is such that no clear signal was coming through. Um, so in, in Senegal, this growing season may be compensated by um, a change in the length of the rains at the end of the season. Um, could you just click? So from the, for the question, um, will the wet season get longer? Could you click the slide, please? The answer is that we are uncertain in this case. Uh, next slide, please. Looking at uh, high impact weather is an area that the AMA 2050 project is very interested in. So we pose the question, are intense storms becoming more frequent? Looking at the satellite record over 35 years, we've been able to demonstrate that yes, intense storms have tripled and uh, global warming is thought to be an important driver for this th trend. So can you click the slide please? Um, are intense storms becoming more frequent? Our message from this was yes. Next slide. Next slide, please. So, oh, yep, the other way. Okay, developing of stakeholder slides. We have uh, revised these uh, from the original set that were developed in 2016, and they are d available in a, with notes in a non-technical language in both French and English, uh, so that we can have a tailored message for our stakeholders in Burkina Faso and also in Senegal. And by presenting these at a number of events, we have incorporated feedback from stakeholders, such as the forms of visualization that they prefer. So like showing things as a histogram rather than um, curves uh, with statistical uh, return periods was one preference that was described. Um, and we are ongoing in our procedures of trying to include feedback from stakeholders. So for example, some of the metrics that I've talked about earlier, um, we're dealing with rainfall 
but um, a preference that stakeholders have also described as looking at high winds and that's show one of the things we're working on at the moment. Um, so we are ongoing in our communications and uh, using key informant scorecards to evaluate um, the stakeholders perception of the reliability of the information and its relevance um, for our project. So it's a quite a dynamic process at the moment. Thank you. From 20, AMA 2050. Thanks very much. That was, that was really interesting to go through that. Um, can you flick over to the next slide on Fractal? Great. Afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm going to be presenting a little bit about Fractal. Um, JP already introduced the project a little bit. Um, but So Fractal is working in Southern Africa. Um, it's, we have a particular focus on cities. Um, so the sort of premise of Fractal is that cities are really interesting and really important in Africa. Um, the urbanization being really rapid, we really um, need to consider how we deal with climate change and climate resilience in cities. And the focus on lands is um, a recognition that cities are very dependent on their code, their codependent region for water and power and food and so on. So it's not just a city in isolation, but the, the codependent region. Um, so that's really the focus of Fractal. Um, so going on to the next slide. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, so Fractal has a number of aims, and I'm going to just focus in on the one main one. Um, but the, the first one is, is clearly to advance scientific knowledge, so very similar to AMNA 2050, um, advance our knowledge of the regional climate processes and responses to global change. The key one we're talking about today is enhancing knowledge on how to integrate this information into decision making. So how do you actually take the science knowledge and use it to inform decision making in, in the cities? Um, further aims are how do we um, responsibly contribute to decision making, um, so very closely related to that. Um, and then to approach this whole process through iterative transdisciplinary co-exploration or co-production, which we'll talk about quite a bit more later um, and we'll come back to in the EVA presentation. So those are the kind of overarching aims. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. So more specifically, we focused in on uh, trying to identify what are the burning issues in African cities. We started the project without a preconceived idea of what these are, um, though we had some ideas. We rather allowed these burning issues to emerge in the initial engagements. Um, what are the socioeconomic governance and physical ed elements of these issues? Um, how might these get worse under climate change? And then uh, the key component of Fractal, I guess, is, is what climate knowledge can we produce that help make better decisions um, under these conditions? And then really importantly, how can we produce this information and communicate it um, with its uncertainties and everything else that goes with it in a way that integrates multiple perspectives and really supports action. So next slide. Just an overview, we're working in nine different cities. Um, some of them we have more emphasis on than others, the so tier one and tier two cities and some self-funded cities but ranging right through Lusaka, Vintuk, Maputo, our tier one cities, Blantyre, Harare, and Gaborone, our tier two cities, and our self-funded cities of Cape Town, Johannesburg, and Durban. All right, moving on. Okay, so a key um, component, and I do need to introduce this because it is the context in which we communicate uncertainty, um, are the learning labs. So Fractal is very um, centered on the learning lab process, which is an ongoing process of learning within each city. Um, so it consists of face-to-face um, -face engagements, but also in between that uh, ongoing activities. The learning labs are meant to be spaces for mutual learning and conversation, and based on some really important principles, um, which again, I think we'll talk about more later. The one is that um, a principle of equal knowledge holders so that everybody in the space has um, some level of expertise in, in different areas. So it's not just climate science expertise, but it's people who have expertise in making decisions in different contexts um, and have different types of knowledge. A really important one is um, that there are places or spaces where we build trust. Um, and we build trust by building long-term relationships. So it's a four-year project. It's a long-term um, relationship building project. Um, we really promote the ideas of honesty and humility, and we even use the idea of humor. Humor is a very powerful um, human process, I guess. 
and very useful, we find, um, to build trust and relationships. And then very important as well is the idea of emergent pathways. So we didn't have predetermined endpoints. We didn't know where the process was going to go. Um, we allowed the process to emerge, which is quite scary for project managers um, and for those involved, but I think it was a really important um, component here. Yeah. Okay, next slide. Okay, I'm going to go very quickly through this, but uh, again, you'll see why it's important later. Um, this is a figure drawn by Anna Taylor, um, who's also here at UCT and very involved in fractal cities. Um, and this is, this is how typical city governance works. We have different institutions. You can actually go to the next slide straight away. Um, here we've highlighted two different institutions. Those institutions are hierarchical. Um, you know, a lot of people at lower levels and it kind of comes up to the leads and the in ministers and so on at the top level of the hierarchy. Um, just go to the next slide. And there are relationships. So people are connected across institutions, um, but that can be quite random. The dotted lines are informal relationships that occur. And then really important that a lot of the information is produced outside of the context of these institutions. So it might be reports and consultancy outputs and um, different types of information that sits kind of outside of these hierarchies. So a lot of the communicating um, science into these contexts is trying to think, how do we change this picture? So go to the next slide. So this is a, a different way of doing it. Um, and this is what we're trying to do in Fractal and in the learning labs is essentially ex build a different way of, of engaging. So here we have different people involved in the learning lab process or in the city. Um, we're trying to sort of semi-formalize the spaces and connections into co-production spaces that are more inclusive and diverse. Um, really important is to develop the capacity, but we look at capacity as the ability to engage and ask questions and analyze problems um, rather than necessarily technical capacity to understand some science output or some process. We're pushing the idea of developing receptivity, um, which again comes into how we communicate uncertain information. It's the receptivity to different ways of looking at the world. Um, and then really key is distilling information. So how do we distill multiple types and sources of information that sometimes contradict and bring that to bear on particular decisions. Okay, moving on. That's all the context. <laughs> so the key approach that we're using in Fractal to communicate climate information and communicate uncertainty is through climate risk narratives. So the real premise is that, um, that people have pre-existing narratives about climate change. If you ask anybody in a city, what do they think climate change is gonna look like in their city, they'll, they'll probably tell you a story. Uh, what, what they think is going to happen. Um, so they have, everyone has these pre-existing narratives. And narratives can be really powerful. We've seen them used in the media really powerfully. Um, we have polar bears on melting icebergs and other kind of imagery and stories that can be really powerful. Obviously, there can also be negative <laughs> narratives that can be destructive. Um, so we need to be careful what type of narratives we're developing. It's, it's also the premise is it's really hard to translate science outputs into things that matter. It's really hard to take the kind of visualizations that we use, you can see at the bottom of the slide there, and for somebody to translate that into something that matters in their context, whether you're developing an informal settlement or making decisions around hydropower, it, it's hard to make those translations. Often we're involved in distilling multiple contradicting lines of evidence. So you have climate models that disagree with each other. You have models that disagree with observations. Um, you have downscaling that disagrees with other downscaling. So we, we're trying to distill um, these multiple lines of evidence into a message. Um, so the underlying assumption here is that actually directly constructing these narratives or stories about things that really matter in the context, rather than presenting raw evidence um, might be more effective and perhaps even more accurate in some senses. And so that's what we explored the narratives. Um, we didn't come up with them within Fractal. We were experimenting with them um, in South Africa and city of Cape Town before Fractal, um, but we've really pushed them a lot further on in Fractal. Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> so this is what they look like. Um, top left there is a sort of classical written narrative. You know, it describes in this case, Vintuk. Um, in the middle of the 21st century and describes what it might look like, lower, rain or, lower run, rainfall, lower runoff, high evaporation rates. Um, we try and use um, things that are relevant to the city. These were then iterated. So 
and engagements in the learning labs, um, participants from the cities would correct it and say, using the wrong term here, or that wouldn't happen. Um, these connections need to be made between these impacts. Um, so these are iterated and co-produced within the learning labs. Um, on the bottom right, we've also experimented different ways of, of presenting them. So for example, there's an infographic version that we use quite a bit in Lusaka. And there you can see the key way that we communicate uncertainty, which is through multiple narratives. So we often end up with three narratives. It seems to work quite well. Um, and those three narratives will represent the, the range of plausible futures within a particular context. Um, each narrative, though, is written in, in certain terms. So we don't use expressions like probably, or there's a high possibility of, or a 30% chance of. Um, we don't use that kind of language, which is quite complex and can be misinterpreted. We use explicit language of certainty within each narrative. Um, and what's really interesting is even though we have different narratives starting with different climate storylines, we often actually end up with similar responses and in some cases even similar impacts um, in different contexts. And that's really helpful. People can start from a position of uncertainty. We're not sure what's gonna happen with the climate and, and slowly converge down to a set of common responses that are actually robust under different um, climate features. A common question we get asked, sorry, just watching the time is going to move fast. <laughs> common question we get asked is which story is more likely? Um, and really pushed back against this. Um, we argue it's, it's essentially impossible um, generally to ascribe formal probabilities to these different um, storylines. Um, it's important that narratives don't replace other decision making and uncertainty methods, such as decision scaling, and we've used those methods as well in Fractal. Um, and if a particular narrative causes concern, then we can definitely further explore the strength of the evidence behind that. So there's, there's scope to unpack particular narratives. Okay, I think last slide. <clears throat> so what's the reality? We found that narratives are really good for starting conversations and breaking down barriers about climate change. So within the learning lab context, um, it gets people talking gets people imagining what climate change might look like, gets people arguing about what it might not look like. Um, and these are really important to break down barriers um, and start discussions. Often those discussions are happening between institutions that we found have never actually spoken about this before. Um, so it's been really powerful. They're also really useful for integrating different types of knowledge um, in a cohesive way. So you can pull in knowledge from a water resource manager and an ecosystems expert and a climate expert all into the same story. Um, so it's really useful for that. Um, we found it really effective at translating the climate science into things that matter. Um, and then they are co-produced and so they are co-owned. They're generally well understood and believe that they're quite well trusted. We do need to consider that they're unusual and unexpected. People are not always sure what to do with them initially. Um, so it needs to be well managed, the process of um, using them. They're not always considered scientific enough. So even though we do um, generally, we, we insist on providing them with the scientific evidence of plots or maps or, and so on, those often are not seen. Um, so people wonder if these are science or if they're just imagined. Um, so we need to keep them anchored in the evidence. And they are safe within the learning space, but what we're really questioning now is how do you let them break free? Can we publish them as a um, sort of output from Fractal? Um, and what are the risks associated with that? So, I mean, just lastly on the right there, you can see some nice feedback. We've got some from some of our reflection processes. People prefer them generally to graphs. They're really useful. Um, you need to have an in-depth knowledge of the context in order to produce these. Um, they're powerful and uh, even described as ingenious. I'm not sure, <laughs> but um, so there's been really positive feedback around the narratives. Okay, I think I've gone too long, but um, yeah covers what we've done in Fractal. Thanks very much. Thanks, Thanks Chris. Chris. Sorry, Jordan, just uh, JP jumping in quickly uh, to ask our attendees and to remind them that uh, the Q&A box is open. So you don't have to save your questions until the end of all the presentations as and when they uh, pop up, you can start uh, posing them in writing. Thanks. On to you, Jordan. Thanks, JP. So, um, I'm just now going to talk a little bit about um, perspectives from psychology and trying to pick apart some of the, the key challenges around communicating uncertainty. Um, and as we've seen, 
Um, uncertainty is embedded within um, climate communications and providing information with decision makers. And there's a range of formats uh, for doing that. So I'm going to touch a little bit about um, what we know from psychology about how people make decisions and then pull out those challenges. And then Irene will be touching on the, the project, thinking about um, how the projects have approached communication and drawing the insights from some research interviews that we've conducted. So I can have the next slide, please. So how do people um, make decisions? We know from cognitive psychology research that this can be um, described in terms of what are called dual process theories of decision making. So on the one hand, we can make very quick intuitive decisions um, or we can take a much more analytical approach. And in um, many everyday contexts, we tend to effortlessly use our intuitive mode. So this enables us to make quick decisions without exerting too much mental effort. And we do this by, um, our, through our experience of the world, by interacting with the world, um, we develop an understanding of how the world works, we develop our personal beliefs, and we can use them to inform these fast and intuitive decisions. In contrast, we can also process information more analytically, but that takes more mental effort and is slower. And what people tend to do is they tend to avoid exerting more effort, um, especially if they believe that their intuitive initial decisions are good. So um, intuitive decisions are actually very good um, in many contexts, and especially so when, when the world around us is predictable. So if our past experiences are predictive of the future, then actually those very intuitive decisions can be very effective. But as we've seen um, with climate change, future climate will not necessarily match our prior experiences. In addition to that, many traditional scientific forms of communicating are really targeted and designed for trying to appeal to our analytical processing. So this presents a, a problem. So how can climate information containing uncertainty be best communicated given that individuals typically make intuitive decisions in the context of their personal experiences and their beliefs. So one approach to this, we can think about developing communications that appeal to our intuitive mode of thinking. Um, and that's really um, in terms of relating back to what Fratt and Lamer are doing in terms of the, the narratives, being to that storytelling approach. And also with some of the other projects that Amara have been doing, such as the participatory modeling, where people actually develop experience of engaging with the data. And alternatively, we can also consider how we might take more traditional scientific formats, such as, such as scientific graphs, and make them more accessible and as a, uh, make their interpretation as intuitive as possible. So next slide, please. So just going to consider a few key challenges. So first of all, um, people may have very different understandings of uncertainty, and this is the potential to impede communication. So uncertainty can come in different forms, and this is just one way of thinking about different types of uncertainty. So there's uncertainty where we kind of fully understand what's going on in the parameters, um, but we can't reduce it. So we can't actually predict with certainty what the outcome will be, but we understand it, the system fully. So this is like um, rolling um, a dice, a six-sided dice. You'll never know what number will come up, but we can very precisely um, um, calculate the probabilities of the numbers appearing. Then we have things that are uncertain, but where we know the main parameters involved, but perhaps we don't fully understand them. So for example, with weather forecasting, as knowledge has advanced of weather systems, for weather forecasts have improved. And of course, similarly with climate models, we understand a lot of aspects of the climate system, and, we're trying, and models are obviously advancing to reduce the uncertainty where possible. Then of course, there are deeper uncertainties where there are aspects outside of our current knowledge, aspects that we might be ignorant of or that might be contested. So for example, to what extent will the world reduce greenhouse gas emissions and when? It's deeply uncertain. So uncertainty can take many forms. And when we're communicating with a range of stakeholders, they might have different levels of understanding and different uh, views and perceptions and experiences of uncertainty. And th those understandings might not be common, um, and therefore that's a potential challenge when communicating if there are these differences of other understanding. So next slide, please. 
So um, thinking specifically about visual representations, um, thinking about differences in understanding. So this is an example of an a intergovernmental panel on climate change figure um, that McMahon and colleagues um, actually asked non-specialists to try and interpret what the main uncertainty was being depicted in this graph. So what the graph is showing, it's showing um, global surface warming across the world over time through to the year 2100. And the different coloured lines show um, different warming under different scenarios. And these are socioeconomic scenarios, so um, under assumptions of how um, the world will develop. Um, and what they found is with non-specialists, when they were asked to describe where most of the, what the most of the uncertainty was attributed to, they falsely attributed it to climate models. Whereas we can see actually the spread in the range of colours that is actually showing um, the spread in the uncertainty of, of what basically the world, how the world will develop and what choices society will make. So the challenge is how, how, much, how might these visual representations be designed to avoid such misunderstandings? Next slide, please. And then of course, we've got a lack of knowledge um, more generally about how best to communicate much deeper uncertainties. So um, from psychology evidence base, we have a lot of research that's looked at probabilistic uncertainty, where for example, perhaps using a variety of formats, so both visual and text, enables a range of stakeholders to understand information transparently. But when dealing with the deeper uncertainties and with climate change, um, it's not clear what might be the most effective ways to communicate it or what factors from or different stakeholders we're working with might influence what the best um, approaches are. Um, and really this is um, an opportunity in the work um, that Amma and Frankl have been doing to use those projects um, to help understand what types of communication of uncertainty work, identify best practice, and, and identify insights from the experiences of those taking part in the project. Next slide, please. Thank you, Jordan. So I'd now like to look at some aspects that have emerged from the project that we undertook in conjunction with Fractal and AMA 2050 and funded by the Future Climate for Africa as well. So um, we liaised with the two projects and leveraged plan activities amongst the two projects in order to undertake a series of interviews uh, with stakeholders and uh, researchers and scientists in the locations in which uh, Fractal and AMA 2050 um, operate. So we undertook in total to, um, 50 interviews during the period of uh, January and June 2018. And they were focused around the region of Senegal and then in Southern Africa as well, in Ballantara, Gaborone, and Windhoek as well. Um, please click on the next one. Thank you. So, uh, in general, uh, with interviews with stakeholders, we focused on how what information they had, which information they used, and which types of information were relevant to decision making. Next click, please. With researchers as well, what kind of information were they producing, how they used climate information, and what they felt and how it was important to communicate that. Next click. And overall then, uh, the, the scope and one of the underpinning um, kind of questions uh, relating to the interviews was really how could decision makers be best supported in using a variety of types of um, information, but specifically climate information and in relation to uncertainties. Next slide, please. So I'd now like to focus around two um, key elements that emerged from this work, uh, focused around trust and co-production. And these will speak to the three uh, challenges uh, that Jordan has just identified. And they're illustrated here in the slide on the left-hand side, sorry, on the top right-hand side, specifically shared understandings and deep uncertainties. So we found that although amongst researchers and scientists, there was uh, use and production of climate information, which also included uncertainties, and uncertainties were found to be important um, to be incorporated and communicated as well. Among stakeholders, there was much less um, use of that climate information, and there was a feeling that um, there was an interpretation of uncertainty, sometimes as not knowing or lack of accuracy. So there might be an indication here that um, information containing uncertainties, uncertainties in themselves, may not be really uh, very much trusted. 
So if that is the case, then there is a scope here for developing shared understandings and trust mutually to actually support the use of information on brand climate, longer term information and incorporation of uncertainties in decision making as well. And this is um, evidence that's also emerged from other previous studies, for example, the one uh, mentioned here, that um, in trust in information and sources, so in the message and the messengers, can be affected in the way that this information is provided and that communication of uncertainty as well. So the various ways in which um, in, uh, trust can be enhanced and also ways in which trust can be measured and evaluated both in the types of data and information, but also in the sources that are used to communicate this. Next slide, please. So one way of undertaking this, for example, is to um, um, uh, be um, a little bit more explicit and open about who the messengers are of particular types of information. So this is their schematic or a pen portrait, if you like, just trying to illustrate some of this. And it's in relation to, for example, um, showing and making visible um, in a variety of different ways um, who, for example, might be producing and might be communicating climate information and uncertainties. So uh, a researcher or a scientist um, might um, be able to uh, indicate um, a little bit more about who they are by providing, for example, a photo of themselves. They might be um, able to um, increase or, or communicate much more openly the, the um, work that they undertake, um, the expertise that they have in undertaking that work in relation to, for example, presenting their personal credentials, their affiliations, institutions that they work with, and also very much the interest that they have in their work and why they feel that they can contribute to it and they have something of value and of relevance to be able to provide here. So you can see the text provides information about all these elements and is very much undertaken in the first person. But this is a schematic that can be applied and used in a variety of different ways with a variety of different messages as well. Next slide, please. So we know also, and that was emerging from our work and also from the literature, that actually sometimes information that is made more accessible, for example, in visual, um, in visual ways, can um, though be associated with a decrease in trust if that information does not meet the expectations of the audiences or of the um, people that it's designed to communicate with. So it's really important, therefore, building upon um, what Am and Fractal have already mentioned and what Jordan mentioned earlier as well, to think about how communication of information, of climate information and uncertainty can be facilitated by more responsive forms of engagement. And there is very much call in various types of literatures for these kind of types of engagement. Next slide, please. So one way in which this might be undertaken, and we've heard about this already, is through this process of co-production. Um, please click. Co-production can be defined and is being used and promoted in a variety of different ways, but perhaps um, a, a generalistic uh, definition of this is um, a type of collaboration and involvement amongst a variety of different actors like decision makers, scientists, researchers, practitioners that tend to work um, through a process with regular contact and interactively in partnership, resulting in some outcomes that are usually jointly owned and that would benefit all those that have been involved as well. So we have found, uh, next click from our project, that sometimes uh, scientific formats of presenting information, including climate information, are difficult to understand by stakeholders and can therefore uh, be less um, used in decision making. This prompts, therefore, the need to actually incorporate the needs of both decision makers and stakeholders and understanding the context of production of that information in the design of those communications and including that uncertainty. So this can be undertaken through a process of co-production, for example. Next slide. Thank you. And we found, oh, click please. We found through the interviews with both researchers and stakeholders that some of these elements really emerged uh, from um, what they were saying and were quite common across um, all types of interviews. Um, click a couple of times, please. So stakeholders and scientists um, both emphasised the importance of um, making more evident and of sharing understanding about the ways in which they operate and where they 
how they work, what values are important and the, um, uh, if you like, process and context in which they work and why that might be. Um, they indicated a need for providing spaces and creating spaces where shared understanding of those different contexts and processes can be um, laid out in the open and for relationships therefore to be built upon those and developed as well. In relation to the narratives, for example, some of our researchers um, interviewed emphasized how they might be really valuable in terms of starting conversations around climate change and uncertainty. Although we found, for example, among some of the stakeholders that when they referred to narratives, they didn't necessarily relate um, uncertainties to them specifically. Next click, please. And also it was a very much a case among uh, researchers that the processes of the time needed for developing narratives, for example, as modes of communication about climate information was really um, important and needed to be acknowledged further. Next click, please. Stakeholder interviewees also refer to opening up and creating spaces for more dialogue, especially with information producers, so that the information then could be conveyed in formats that would be relevant to those who might be using them. Next click. But it, so therefore there seems to be a call and an interest in processes of co-production, but it's very evident that that requires the willingness and the commitment of partners and potential input from all those that might be involved. Um, and it requires time and resources as well. So in occasions where, if you like, full co-production might not be possible, there are other um, ways in which uh, other best practices and other processes can be drawn upon in order to try and encourage and formalise that engagement and maintain that through time. Next slide, please. Great. So um, I'm just now, so if you just click um, three more times, please. Thank you. So um, I'm just now going to talk about um, a little kind of rubric to bear in mind um, in terms of original representations. So as Reni pointed out, sort of co-producing and developing visuals that um, support decision making is really important. And, and I guess this rubric of message, audience, design and evaluation kind of encapsulates some of the key principles um, to think about in that process. So first of all, it's around understanding the message and that's going to be communicated. Um, and that's why it's really important to engage with the audience and understand what are their challenges that they're facing day to day, what sort of information would be useful to their decision making context, and that can help tailor the message of the visual. Thinking about the audience, obviously co-production um, is really um, designed to engage with the audience and to support an understanding of, of what type of visual might be appropriate. The design, so there's a, um, a body of uh, literature from cognitive psychology that informs how visuals can be effectively designed um, so that they're more easily understood. And I'm going to show an example of one of those in a moment. And then lastly, evaluation. So has the visual been tested with the audience? And obviously co-production is a really effective format because that evaluation happens iteratively um, and constantly through a cycle. So it's really embedded into the, the, into the design of, of those activities. Next slide, please. Have the next slide, please. Thank you. So I'm um, just going to show a quick example of, of some of those cognitive visual design principles that I mentioned. So here's a figure produced by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And again, it's showing global mean temperature over time, and it's showing observations um, into the 21st century, and then for the future, looking at um, uh, pro projections of warming um, under two different scenarios. So if we um, have the next slide, please. So there's a number of things that we can do to try and make the uncertainty and the information there more accessible. So next slide, please. Here I've circled um, some key changes made. So you see at the top there, there's a very clear title and as well um, some additional context. So this is providing information to the reader, perhaps if they don't have an expert on hand that they can ask, it's very clear what the information relates to and what the different um, scenarios being depicted are. On the right, you can see that actually, instead of forcing the reader to try and match up the visual elements to a legend, we can actually integrate those labels much more closely to the data. And that's gonna be much more easy for the reader to, to read, but also less likely for them to kind of make errors, especially with much more complicated figures. 
Um, so, and you can also see we've actually used colour, so we've matched up text to colour and therefore again it enables people to make those links between the information in the text and the visual much more intuitively. Next slide please. Mm -hmm. Okay, so from uh, the project and from the work that we've already heard about in relation to Alma and Fractal, we would like to provide a few recommendations. Please um, click for more times. So um, as we've heard from Jordan, it's important to uh, provide information that's accessible, but that also um, highlights in the case of this presentation, the nature of the uncertainty that's included in there without compromising trust in the materials and in the science that's behind that. So it's important to get a balance between the main elements of uh, the representation, for example, or the communication that we're providing and the very specific de detail that's included. A lot of that can be informed by creating uh, processes through which shared understandings are developed and through which um, under um, understandings, knowledges are communicated and um, included in the creation and then the development of those materials. The materials and also um, the, the sources of information can be evaluated in relation to the content, but also in relation to the trust of the process through which they're created throughout their development and potentially reuse and transformation later down the line. That can be done in qualitative and quantitative ways as well. We've identified that co-production is a model of good practice. There are constraints um, in relation to employing that and um, there can be other approaches put in place that will enable um, um, other ways of engagement and of um, evaluating and continuing that engagement in other ways so that um, information and um, communication needs are elicited through potentially iterative designs, through uh, ways of evaluating communication to, in, to encourage information and to enable information to continue to be useful and therefore to be acted upon. And that evaluation can be built in also in relation to understandings of that uncertainty and um, creating opportunities for that relevance to be maintained and therefore for that input to decision making to occur. Thank you very much uh, to everybody who's presented. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Jordan and Irene. It's JP uh, back online. Uh, and Robin, thanks for that slide. Uh, before we dive into a few more Q&As, we've also um, compiled in our slide deck uh, some resources for further reading. And it's worth noting that both the session recording will be shared on our YouTube channel, um, as well as the slides will be shared uh, in an email and on our website to all of the registrants for this um, workshop. Uh, the, uh, we've got two slides for recommended further reading if you have an interest in this topic. Um, and the, I think in particular, the slide deck that Tanya and Emma has been talking about, um, a full presentation of that deck is available on our YouTube channel. Thank you very much to the presenters and thank you also to everyone who have been submitting questions uh, via the Q&A dialogue. Uh, as I'm sure many of you have already been reading, you would have seen um, we've answered about six questions and a, another couple are open. Um, so in that regard, uh, I think I'm going to maybe pull together a couple of questions first that was directed at uh, Tanya and Emma, because I know Tanya has to run on the hour uh, sharply. Um, and I just wanted to push your answer on them a bit further. So um, there were a couple of questions relating to which methods you've essentially used for which of your engagements. Emma 2050 have engaged a very wide spectrum of stakeholders from national policymakers on, on uh, Senegal's NAP and NDC through to marginal uh, groups and, and just district level officials um, trying to communicate longer term agricultural impacts and trends. Can you maybe give us a bit more of a breakdown on what methods you've used in different scenarios and maybe briefly what you've learned from those engagements? Um, okay, so I'll make a start. Um, as we um, mentioned at the beginning, the stakeholder slides were something we developed early on in the project for our initial uh, interactions with our stakeholders and from that we've also then included other formats as Emma 
touched on. So for example, um, in Senegal, part of our participatory modeling, we had a plateau game, which is a representation of, in, in a board game fashion, it represents the models. So certain decisions that are taken at the farming level for whether you're looking at um, investments in insurance or if you're investing in uh, irrigation or uh, uh, water housing technologies so that we can have a kind of role playing as well as taking that in from learning into the actual bioeconomic model that's being run by one of our partners so that's one participatory method that we've used um, with farmers with the uh, national adaptation plans that's very much come from the wider climate uh, scenarios and work that we've done across the Sahel because that's those are running in Senegal and Burkina Faso and other countries so we've used both depending on which decision process we've been uh, addressing. Yeah and just to briefly build on what Tanya mentioned um, I think we've been quite fortunate in some ways in Senegal because there are a series of national level decision making processes ongoing which the slides have been very timely to inform so there's the National Adaptation Plan and there's also the uh, National Agricultural Plan, BRACADS. Um, and there's also a series of uh, sub-national uh, decision-making processes at regional level, so sub-national sub regional level, um, looking at local development plans. So uh, we've been able to take the slides to inform those processes. Um, but as Tanya mentioned, we've been using different processes, different approaches in different, uh, to inform different levels of decision making. And the theatre forum is actually proving very interesting as an approach where you can explore different uh, solutions and questions at very many different levels, uh, not just at kind of a local level where people might think about using theatre, but we're actually going to use it even amongst project, the project partners of AMA to really uh, raise these issues around co-production and what it means for scientists to take on uh, new roles that many, many of them are not actually accustomed or trained to undertake. Uh, so just a few thoughts. Thank you very much. Thanks, Emma uh, and Tanya. Maybe one, one last question before we move on to some questions for Chris and, um, and Jordan and Irene. Uh, were there any particular barriers that you've come across in presenting the, the consensus information and the state of the science over West Africa to varied audiences in the uptake of that information or barriers as it pertains maybe to the usefulness of, of what we've established as, as the current state of the science over the region? Uh, I mean, I can kick off and I'm sure Tony will have more to, to add. Um, I mean, some of the barriers are some of the information that people want were not included in the slides. And as Tanya mentioned, the, the feedback from decision makers has been taken to the scientists to see if they can address that. So, for example, in Senegal, decision makers are very keen to also have information about wind, high wind. So that's been taken to the scientists to, to look at. Um, and there's also been uh, some difficulty, obviously, in communicating quite difficult uh, information, complex information, and that's why the slides have uh, been largely used in a kind of face-to-face -face, uh, forum, although they are also available um, with, with you know, uh, accompanying text and uh, with a pre-recorded um, uh, introduction and an uh, explanation. Um, so well, to kind of overcome some of these challenges, they've also been broken down into kind of smaller chunks. And we've used a, a, a forum called Café Scientifique or World Café, where parts of the, of the information have been uh, introduced in smaller groups and with scientists directly with decision makers so they can explore a particular figure or piece of information in a, in a much more informal setting rather than in a kind of PowerPoint and plenary format. Um, but I pass to Tanya in case she's got any other uh, feedback to provide. 
Um, no, th thanks, Emma. I think you've captured most of it, and um, particularly also with the Café Scientifique, these were small groups, and it was close interactions with um, those who have developed um, particular graphics or um, information. Um, so, you know, for example, we've, we've, we've talked about Senegal, but also in Burkina Faso, some uh, we're looking at flooding in the city of Ouagadougou. So they're having the scientists sitting down talking with certain technical advisors and decision makers one-on-one -on -one was really appreciated to get clarity on what we can communicate, but also to inform um, our, our modeling work and how we can tailor our outputs to address questions that are relevant. So it's that two-way co-production back and forth interactions with individuals that um, has proved very useful. Thanks, Tanya and Emma. I'm aware that we're three minutes over and uh, maybe if our uh, attendees and our panelists will allow us to run two more minutes over, I might like to just pose one or two more open questions that I think uh, I think warrants a, a response maybe. And maybe from Chris uh, this time. Um, Walter's question uh, is I think quite provocative where he questions the uh, sometimes the appropriateness of bringing scientists and particular types of decision makers together directly face to face in a in an exchange where uh, I guess the the main gist of that question and you can read it in the open Q&A box is whether it's preferable in some instances to to have intermediaries um, uh, in, a, in a kind of a chain of communication in a wider process. What's been the experience within Fractal and, and the learning labs in with the appropriateness of, of you know, climate modelers discussing things directly with um, different types of decision makers and stakeholders. Yeah, thanks, Walter. I mean, thanks, JP. I think that's a really, really good question. And it's one we've discussed a lot in, in Fractal. Um, I think early on in Fractal, we kind of took the view that, yes, definitely we should get all the climate scientists into the learning labs. They should all be involved. Um, but I think we have realized that there, there are certain skills, um, certain ways of engaging. Um, you're essentially playing a, a facilitation role in that process. Um, so it's really important that the climate scientists that are involved, uh, if you like, able to, to hold that, that kind of space and those kind of discussions. Who are able to talk um, and communicate about the science in a way that is understandable. Um, and, who are, and I think what's really important who are able to, to listen. Um, so for the first few learning labs, the climate scientists really just listened. We hardly provided any input at all. Um, we, we tried as much as possible just to listen and to understand other people's perspectives and their ways of talking about things and ways of approaching things. Um, so I think coming out of the process, I, th I think there's a real skill and a real need for climate scientists who can play that role, um, but it's certainly not everyone. Yeah, it's really important. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we're already five minutes over and uh, maybe in cutting it short at this point. Um, Karin, I'd just like you to uh, share our, um, our quick poll whilst I close down the, the proceedings. Uh, to all our attendees, there's a very quick multi-choice uh, multi uh, poll on, on how much you enjoyed and, and found this webinar useful. So it'd be great if you could uh, complete that for us. That'll be up for about two minutes. Whilst you're doing that, I just like to add that all of the questions that are open that we haven't managed to answer yet, we will answer in writing and we'll send out an email to all of the attendees with uh, the, the list of, of written questions and written responses to them. So we will get to them, uh, even if we can't now. Um, with that, I'd also like to thank our panelists, um, Chris, Jordan, Irene, Emma, and Tanya, thanks so much for your experiences uh, in this. Um, there is, I think, potentially one follow-up question, kind of one question, final question that I have for our attendees, and that is, if there are any uh, parts of our discussion today that triggered your interest uh, on particular components of, of communication, uh, 
um, of climate information and uncertainty. If there are particular areas where you would like to learn some more uh, and maybe think you could be uh, learning more from FCFA's experience, please do note that uh, to us as well uh, in the question and answer panel. Uh, and we'll definitely see if we can frame future webinars around the noted interest that, that attendees have in, in more specific questions that we can maybe delve in deeper to. Um, so with that, uh, thank you to all our panelists um, and to all our attendees, thank you very much for the questions and you will hear from us very shortly uh, with a follow-up email with all of the uh, further reading resources and recordings of this session and other useful um, um, videos and resources. With that, I am going to wrap up the session uh, only seven minutes over time. <laughs> Have a great day, wherever you are. Chat soon. Thank you, bye.